Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today with Al Muhajirun Al Arab. Marhaban Jamian, Alan Bikum Fi Multaq Al Arab, Fi Barnamij Al Muhajirun Al Arab. And we're happy to be here. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Hello, everybody. Uh, today, we are honored to be uh, host, uh, to host uh, Mr. Glenn Murray, who is uh, very well known in our community and also in, in Canada. Um, uh, he is running for the position of the mayor of the city of Winnipeg. Today is the 20th of October, 2022. And uh, as we have always um, uh, been with you, we, wanna, we want you to be uh, pre uh, participating and active in, uh, in, in the community. We want you to go there to know who's your candidate. We want you to go and give your votes and uh, to know who you're voting for. Know them on a personal level because they are the people who are going to be helping us for the many years to come, sometimes uh, one or more terms. So uh, by all means, we're going to introduce Mr. Glenn. Glenn, very much. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you. It's great pleasure. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, um, Glenn. If you, I, I know you, nobody, uh, you, you, you the, there is no need for you to introduce yourself because you have held so many positions and you've been also involved in in our community at large uh, for many uh, many occasions. But for those who don't know you, please, if you don't mind, introducing yourself. Sure. Well, I, I was mayor of the city of Winnipeg um, from 1998 to 2004. I was a councillor for nine years before that, so I spent 15 years at City Hall. Um, got very uh, involved with the Muslim and Arab community here, very important part of our city. But around some really important issues, we um, were looking at, uh, we started the Refugee Assurance Program. The insurance program allowed um, people who were sponsoring families to come to Winnipeg if they were Winnipeggers, they wouldn't have to raise the money to put up the guarantee for the government, which would be five, 10, 15, 20, $30,000, depending on how many people in the size. So that was expensive for people. And that worked very, very well. It was uh, spe especially during in areas, uh, many parts of the Arab world in Syria, when there's been droughts, we obviously in Ukraine now. Um, and that assurance program um, brought about, allowed about 18,000 people to come to Winnipeg. It was unique to Winnipeg. <clears throat> that was unfortunately unfunded a few years ago by one of my opponents in this election mm. and, and other councils. Um, and we really need to bring that back. That, that was worked on very much <coughs> because of many of you know, South Sudan, many of the areas in that. And then we worked on um, uh, finding land, uh, the city with the federal government and with the community for the Muslim Cultural Center. Uh, there were a number of those on the Filipino. There was a Hindu cultural center. Uh, we did We couldn't provide land for a mosque, but what we were able to fund the, that the uh, to fund the cultural center and, and I think a mosque could be co-located nearby. And then of course, uh, I think you mentioned it early, uh, earlier, which was uh, working with Mr. Altassi and a number of other people in the community uh, to try to establish a Muslim school. There's a lot of people who come particularly from um, more theological based countries who, you know, who are, um, growing up in a, a different kind of culture than we have in Canada. Uh, so it can be quite a shock. So the school was a way of allowing families to bring their children acclimatized to, uh, to Canadian culture um, and have a school in which they had some control and some influence over, over education. And it was a nice transition and often their children at one point would go on to the public school system. So a, a lot of involvement with, with, with the community and a lot of um, really have found it the Arabic and, and, and the wider, wider Muslim community here, very, very dynamic and very welcoming. It's uh, you know, every time we have, you know, whether Ukrainians uh, to uh, Muslims to an incredible array of people here, it's really quite remarkable. It makes our city more exciting and gives us better food for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, over the last 10 years, I've seen so many different amazing restaurants opening up. Uh, Indian food, Greek food, Italian food. Um, yeah, Middle Eastern restaurants are remarkably good. It's, uh, <laughs> quite, quite, we're very lucky living in Canada because uh, if you lived in Japan, you're pretty gonna, pretty much going to eat yeah. Japanese, <laughs> see Japanese people. It's not, 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 not too many countries are as multicultural as Canada is, unfortunately. It's very true, very true. Um, we understand that uh, we have, you've also um, been involved in politics from different, uh, in different positions other than the mayor of uh, the city of Winnipeg. Yes, I was uh, a cabinet minister in Ontario um, for seven years, um, elected uh, in Toronto Centre. 
uh, I was the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure at the same time. I was Minister of uh, Environment and Climate Change, training, training colleges and universities, which is very interesting, and then research and innovation, which was the small ministry I had, but it was one of the most exciting because you were working on the front lines of some of the most, some of the greatest innovations going on in our country right now. So, mm. yeah. How do you see your experience in those uh, in those positions, other than the mayor point? How do you see that benefiting you in the new in the new position? Well, the renewed position you're running in for the city of Winnipeg. Well, you know, I being a cabinet minister in the largest province. I mean, many of the ministries I, some of the ministries I was minister of had budgets bigger than the province of Manitoba's budgets. Uh, so it was um, it was quite an experience learning in transportation infrastructure, uh, understanding policy, the politics, and the organization of how provinces work are very important for mayors. Um, it was a real learning experience for me because 90% of any kind of change you want to make in city politics, you have to go to the province because the province controls the legislation and gives can give uh, gives give the, can say yes or no to many of the things that the city needs to do. Mm -hmm. um, so from the time that you ran, uh, that you actually um, was the mayor of, of Winnipeg till the time now that you're coming back into the, the position, uh, what things have you uh, seen in Winnipeg that has changed from your uh, under your leadership till now? Well, it's interesting. Um, in the city, um, I, I mean, I think a lot of the things we started got finished: the airport, uh, the, the convention center expansion. Uh, the waterfront drive the canadian museum for human rights very very it was very exciting to come back and see my first jets game after uh, so many years when the jets were away in the arena is uh, the arena just got finished as i finished up my term so that was very exciting uh, it's also you know seeing many new neighborhoods in the city uh mm -hmm. you know an expanding population um and and there's always things i love that you never forget i have to say, I, I love dim sum, and Winnipeg has the best dim sum I've ever had. A Kumkun Garden is like, uh, and Chinatown is amazing. Uh, yeah. So it was nice to see some of the things that were familiar uh, and uh, still there, and still very much uh, active part, of it, yeah, active institutions in our community. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool. It's uh, there's something you know. The Forks is always beautiful. Or we, you know, a lot of the work we did on Waterfront Drive and opening up our riverfront made our downtown much, much more beautiful. But also you notice know, the rise in crime. The, the, the we no yeah. longer have community-based police officers. Um, yeah. You know, th there's a lot of things right now. Um, the level of, of maintenance in the city, streets, garbage. Uh, the city, the city really needs some tuning up right now. I think. Mm -hmm. And that's that's maybe my next my next question. I mean, we uh, some of us would travel to uh, our neighbors, just our neighbors down south uh, south uh, in, in the states. The, we see the streets are better than our streets for some reason. We go to other provinces just close by as well. We don't have the same potholes and uh, maintenance and so on that seems to be constantly happening. I don't know. Um, many people are frustrated. This is just one of the things. And you mentioned also the issue with the high crime compared to other major cities and so on w what things do you have in mind and if, you, if you're elected as a, as a mayor to um, to tackle these issues how do you propose to do so well in a lot of ways it's sort of hard to get through because they're they're quite substantive and they're very um there are many of these things are on my website there is a um, a commitment to bring back our neighborhood safety plans every city a neighborhood in the city had a, its own constructed uh, safety plans, looked at the walkability of the neighborhood, looked at how does policing work? Why do you have community policing? Are the libraries and pools open so that it's convenient and safe for people to go? Um, you know, those, though, is there housing in your neighborhood that's abandoned? So we'd identify if there's abandoned houses or burnt out houses and getting those cleaned up, removing dangerous air looking at dangerous areas in the neighborhood and getting the police working with the community to clean those up uh sight lines areas where this where the neighborhood was in a state of disrepair um and the or was dark and not well lit and we would do a safety audit and that so that was really to help everyone make their neighborhood safer and help people feel safer in their neighborhoods which a lot of people don't right now um and restoring the community-based police program we had under Chief Castles and Chief Clunas. We had a very, very strong um, community-based policing. We put police 
out in higher crime neighborhoods to uh, be very visible on the street, help bring the crime rate down and gave people an immediate sense of safety. Um, mental health and addictions, as you, as you know, all the way, um, I worked as a street outreach worker with yeah. involved kids, and that was a very big part of my life. Um, and those programs are mostly have disappeared. There's not a lot of capacity there. We have really great community health centers. So working with the province to get a, an addictions and mental health strategy um, and to bring those housing programs back. We used to, we brought, we built a couple thousand housing units record in Canada when I was mayor. Um, and those programs have been stripped away. So refunding those because they don't net cost us money in the end. Yeah. If we don't restore and maintain our older neighborhoods, keep our community facilities up, then they do go into decline and people leave and the cost of fire, paramedic response, if buildings are on fire, people are getting sick, or the, the cost of trying to rebuild a neighborhood after it's gone into decline is very, very expensive. So, um, so some of the things we always hear from uh, from the from the community is, I know, I know some people do not uh, know the the jurisdiction, which which is it, which which government is it the municipal or the provincial or the federal that's looking after things? But people yeah. complain about the long wait times in hospitals, the you know the high crime crime rate and so on. Yeah. Um, how how is the city uh, and, and your position as the mayor of the city? How is the city gonna uh, work co co collaboratively with the province in dealing with some things that affects the city the city uh, residents, but it's actually under the provincial uh, uh, control. Well, I mean, the city and the province are so intertwined, it's very hard to separate who's in charge, entirely in charge of what. The two are interdependent. Um, the province has a big budget and lots of tax revenue. The city gets 45% of the property tax bill, 55% goes to um, the uh, school boards. And the um, it's important to, uh, to know that that's one of the reasons I'm running very strongly on getting the same kind of financial arrangements that many cities like Minneapolis and others have to, uh, they, they have a sales tax, they get a, a part of the sales tax and I'm putting forward that we get 1% of the provincial sales tax. So we would have the same revenue streams because right now we, we don't have the, the money to um, fix these problems. Our budget, you know, we get less than 10% of all the tax revenues that all of us pay. No, over 90% goes to the federal and provincial government and that's unusual. Um, mm -hmm. um, Generally, cities in in the U.S. we get a much larger share. Canadian cities, it depends. Some some have many more funding sources, like Toronto. Uh, others are in the same boat that we're in. But um, that that is a big, big challenge. Which is why everyone's platforms in this election are all about going to beg for money to you know fix Keniston or beg for money to do housing, because uh, cities just don't have the revenue streams and they have to go cap in hand to other governments to beg for money, which is complicated, means it's very hard for them to sustain it. Because even if you build a big roadway or you have a, a really great, you know, uh, affordable housing project, those all cost money to operate after and maintain. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, there's a lot of challenges right now with city finance. And that's why I'm proposing this plan to negotiate with problems. And I did it successfully before. I mean, we did, I, I was chair of the Big City Mayor's Caucus. We got the a gas tax uh, from the federal government working with Prime Minister Paul Martin. Uh, we got uh, GST exemptions that put quite a, little, a lot of money back into cities when cities would no longer charge GST and allowed them to uh, retain a lot more revenue of the ta tax. So we were double taxing, we were taxing tax revenue, which seemed a little yeah. bit crazy. Yeah. So those were some big accomplishments. And we, I want to move on now with the province and engage with the Premier to put together an agreement that would make the city more sustainable. Oh, and um, one, 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 another area is the downtown. So every city, uh, usually the downtown in every city is the jewel, is the is the flagship that you people bring in people from the airport and show them the, the, the downtown. With the exception of some cities in, in North America, um, our downtown has have some nice, beautiful new projects, but also has some challenges that seem to have made some uh, business uh, owners move to other areas like Keniston or Bridgewater and so on to. To avoid, and some of them you've mentioned before, like safety and, and so on. Uh, what do you propose that you might uh, do to try and attract bus businesses back into into downtown area? Well, we did a lot. I mean, we moved the we moved the arena downtown. We created the shed district, which is still working very well. I mean, there's the Wawanisa yeah. building is yeah. going up. The Sutton Place Hotel, five uh, five star hotel of residence, all that work for all that infill from the convention center all the way up to the Alt Hotel and Center Point and the and, and the Glass House. Uh, we've really seen uh, a real revival there. But 
that program kind of stopped. So we that was where a program where the city went in, looked at what infrastructure was needed in the case of True North. Of the arena, it was an arena, and it was a public square. On Waterfront Drive, it was a parkway and a beautiful street, uh, and public places. Uh, restoration of heritage buildings. The next precinct was Red River, River College Polytech, which is a major, um, which is a major, um, was a major uh, reinvestment that really built the tax base in the area. Got a lot of students down there, and all of that gets eyes on the street. And we should be doing something east of Portage of Maine between Bannantyne and and uh, um, Steve, uh, William Stevenson Way and all along Westbrook, that whole area between the river and Main Street is pretty hollowed out. It's all parking lots and not in great shape. As mm -hmm. you know, well, you have great stuff at the Forks to the south and you have great stuff in the East Exchange up around Waterfront Drive where Chibos yeah. is and the Pump House and all the theaters and the non-such and Patent Five. It's a really cool hip neighborhood. But right in between those two neighborhoods, it's just a sea of badly uh, maintained parking lots. And in the winter, it looks absolutely uh, desolate. Uh, mm -hmm. Who want to walk through a windy series? Of, so, I mean, it's re knitting back our downtown that's important. And Center Venture, one of the most successful downtown development corporations, you know, yeah. within when I was mayor alone, it, it brought 36 abandoned buildings back. And I, I mean, buildings that are a couple hundred thousand square feet in many cases. But it, it's lost its funding, it's lost its resources and its mandate to put deals together in the downtown and it put those district deals together so i want to bring that back completely refinance it reinvest it uh and and get us back to do that and modernize computerize the entire permits and approval system it's because right now we have a very kind of analog kind of system in government <clears throat> and it's very hard to get approvals through the city right now and i want to take that on i work in the software sector and there's algorithms and software things called SaaS service uh, software as a service, so it's basically you can your 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 access to government is on your laptop, and you can um, and and you can manage most of your stuff without having to go into an office or you know even filling out a form, just an electronic interaction. So uh, we have a, a really great book written by Gavin Newsom, who was mayor of San Francisco, called Citizenville, and he wrote this book about how government could basically sort of citizen manage government. So you you mm. work with government. Uh, off a menu, and you 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 serve yourself, uh, which we can do now. And that, so it's it's stuff that's happened in business ten years ago is now catching up to government. And I think there's some exciting opportunities for Winnipeg to really be a leader in innovative, smart smart technology. So I I I, I don't have too much more time. So uh, no, no worries, no worries. I'll 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 end with one last question. I, th I know yeah. because we're short for time for you. Um, what are things that seem to be close to you to your heart to, that you'd like to to see really big changes that that sets you apart from your the other candidates that you really have your heart set on it that actually made you come back and decide to run for mayor. Well, I came. I did come back to run for mayor. I came back five years ago to start some businesses, and 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 you know I fought, fell in love with the city and the people in the city. There's no other place where you can have as as interesting and diverse a population, such great cultural and sports and entertainment, uh, such beautiful parks, Assiniboine Park, Kildonan Park, and many others. Um, and and I always wanted to come back. It was hard. You have to make a living. And, you know, you know Gary Dewar went off to be the ambassador in the United States. Lloyd Axworthy went off to the Lee Institute. Um, I went off to University of Toronto. Um, and, and I always have been homesick. So I came, and when I came back, I started working a lot in the community in the downtown. And I saw even before COVID a lot of problems. And I said, you know, I, I'm looking across the city and it could be so much better. Everyone should have a key to a safe place to live. And that's been personally for me. I rode my bike to Atlanta, Georgia with Habitat for Humanity, 59 other people to Kansas City because I think it's important to be a role model. And we raised a lot of money as a group for affordable housing here. You know, I didn't just talk about street kids and kids on the street and people with mental health and addictions. I worked and helped build a new community health center here that was called Village Clinic. We raised the money for it. And then I was doing street outreach work. So I was working with kids on the street. I foster parented a child and took them home because I, I really feel that each of us as citizens have to live our lives according to our values, our faith and our our, our, uh, we should, our life should be a model of what we believe is right and good in the world. And um, so I've always lived that way. And I think that's uh, something quite true to the Quran and to Islam. And, um, you know, we all have these commonalities, you know, of 
intersections between where we come from. And it's always amazing. You come from halfway around the world and you find you have so many connected values and common spirituality and hope. And what I'm really hoping for is to, is to really bring what my friend Shahina Siddiqui calls, which is bringing back the soulfulness and heart of the city, this culture mm. of caring and respect uh, that seems to be so elusive. Mm. These days. Uh, and I think that, you know, if we can role model that, you and I having these conversations, improve the civility, create a more welcoming city, get our refugee, because, you know, we're coming into 20, 30 years, there's going to be a lot more Syrians and a lot more Ukraines, and we're going to have to decide how we're going to welcome people. And I think Winnipeg, and thanks to Chief Peguson our indigenous, and the indigenous people of this area, we have been a welcoming place for thousands of years. Yeah. And in the last couple of hundred, we've really brought large parts people from all over the world. And I don't want us to lose that because with the environmental crisis where people are going to have to move because of food shortages and water yeah. and changes in their geography or, or conflicts in war like in Ukraine, which we're likely sadly going to see more of, I think we want to be a city that continues to welcome people from around the world when they're in crisis. And we, we, we will always be a refuge for refugees and a sanctuary for people. I think that's important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I know you're uh, running a very tight time with the, the, with the elections coming up. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to go out and vote. And uh, now that you've met uh, with uh, some of the candidates and with, uh, with Glenn, he's very personalized, as you can see. <laughs> and I hope that we all will have the chance to uh, to meet him and others in person. And I encourage everybody to go and uh, vote in the in the in the early elections and also in the elections coming on October twenty sixth. Well, uh, I mean, I, I, if I if I win this, uh, I would hope I, we could come back and have a conversation not about what we'd like to do, but what you and I and the community can do together. Once you know, I'd love that. I would love that. I will welcome that. Thank, thanks very much. And okay. uh, wishing you all the best. And thanks, everyone, for, for watching. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye.